Good Sunday morning, TVC, and Nelson coming at you again. Just want to um, spread some joy, share some announcements, and just let you know how much we're thinking about you. We're here near the end of phase one in our reopening plan. More people are getting vaccinated, which is great, and our numbers are lower of COVID-19 infections, which is also great. So pray for all those that are in the hospital, that are suffering from COVID-19, that they'll get well, and pray that our number of infections will keep going down and down so that we can get to phase two on June 16th. And then hopefully a couple weeks after that, we can go to phase three where we can open up in person again, which I am so excited for. Just want you to be thinking about our rooted youth um, and our high school youth because it's soon coming up to graduation. And our triplets, Grace and Noah and David, they graduate this year. And the church family at TBC has watched them grow up because Scott and Allison and their kids have been part of this church, you know, their children's whole lives. So it's very exciting as they get towards graduation. I also want you guys to be looking out for each other. If you know someone needs a little pickup, a little email, a little text, a little call, or you can even meet people outdoors if you keep in your bubbles of 10, just to kind of keep um, up with everybody. And if there's any needs that God places in your heart, please act upon them. The work of the church goes on. We had our leadership meeting on Tuesday night. Uh, we still pray, um, or we, we ask for your prayers and all the work that's going for that as we try to kind of look towards rebranding, relaunching, seeing what we can do to really make a difference in our community. Also, um, our rooted youth, who were, we all met together by Zoom on Wednesday night. So I just want you to be in prayer for all of them. And uh, we're hoping to do one more Zoom and then we hope to be able to meet outdoors. And then we're praying that Bayside Camp can open up this summer so that our um, senior hires and, and newly graduated kids that are going to be working at camp for the summer can work in an overnight camp and that all of our uh, junior high youth and stuff that go to Root It will be able to go to camp this summer. Don't forget, um, you still need uh, your tithes and offerings to keep things going here at TBC. And um, Alexandra has done a lot of stuff with some children. She's now done her second children's video and she's been um, reaching out to all the families and looking at what our children's ministry can look like this summer and what we can launch in September as well. So um, look out for those emails. And at any time, if you need anything, you can always reach out to Pastor Elias, you can reach out to myself or any member of our leadership team. Let's go to God. Dear God, thank you so much for today. Thank you so much that we're here to worship together. We're here to praise your name and Father, with all the things happening in our world, with all the signs of injustice and prejudice and racial inequalities, Father, just help us all just see each person the way you do, that every person in this world is worth dying for, and they are worth showing unconditional love to. So Father, help each one of us to show that love. Help each one of us to be just someone who just um, respects and honors and just befriends the people all around us and shows no sign of inequality or differences between us, Father. And Father, just be with the pastor, be with the music and the different components of the service today, and may this whole service come together to be a blessing for those who are watching it. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week, TVC. We'll hopefully see you soon. Hi everybody, I have one quick announcement. We have started a new program for the children of TBC. Um, it's a new video series that will be 10 to 15 minutes each week, including a story, some Bible time, some prayer, and it will all be based on the same message that the adults are learning about on Sunday from Pastor Elias. So um, this video will be out on our TBC Facebook and YouTube by Saturday morning, if not before. So I just encourage you to check it out, um, see if you can learn some great things from it. If this is not a useful tool for you, feel free to let me know that too, because knowing what is beneficial and helpful for the families in this church will help us know how to move forward a little bit with some children's ministry stuff in the future as well. So thank you, and I hope you check it out, and I hope you can learn great things from it as well.
Good morning, TBC. As I record this video for you, kids in our own community are heading back to school this week after a number of weeks at home doing online learning as a result of the pandemic. We have experienced the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on education in our own community, in our province, and in our country. And I wanna remind you that the pandemic has had devastating effects on education in countries around the world, especially in the global south. And through my work at Canadian Baptist Ministries, we have started a brand new initiative called Active in Mission this summer, where we are gonna raise funds to support CBM's educated related programs in eight countries through our partners. That's in the Philippines, uh, the Dominican Republic, Rwanda, India, Lebanon, Bolivia, Myanmar, and Guatemala. And I would love for you to join me in this. Um, we've set up a team page called Team TBC, and our route during the week of July 18th will be from Beachville Lakeside Timberley Elementary School all the way to Ridgecliff Middle School. It's about a 6.4 kilometer walk, and we can actually complete that by going along the beautiful rails to trails. So if you would like to join me during the week of July 18th to complete this walk and raise funds as we go, um, I would love to have you on our team. You can go to activeinmission.ca and follow the links to Team TBC. We'll give you uh, all of those direct links. Um, and you can either sign up or donate and join us to walk. We know that education is a really important tool to help fight generational poverty. And so we're committed to this work um, through my, my work at CBM. And I would love for you to join us in Active in Mission this summer. strange singing along in your living room but if you can today the words to the song are simple and I want this prayer to be on your hearts today as we go through today's service this is meet with me
Hello friends, Miss Edna here and Joy as well, Miss Joy. And we're so glad to have her back today. And the last time that Joy was here, she showed us a picture that she made, a beautiful picture with her name on it. And it's spelled J-O-Y, J-O-Y spells Joy. And do you want to tell us again what it means? Yeah, uh, J is for Jesus, right? And O is for others, and Y is for you or me. <laughs> good job, that's good, Joy. And so pretty, and you use some pink. It's my favorite. <laughs> yeah, we know that, and that's my favorite too. And joy is a fruit of the spirit as well, isn't it? And today, I believe you made another beautiful picture. And this one says love. And it's spelled L-O-V-E. Yep. And I see you made uh, a beautiful heart for the letter O. Yeah, it's love. That's right. Hearts usually represent love, don't they? And you use some very pretty pink for the word, for the letters, all pretty pink colors. Yeah, it's my favorite, <laughs> right? And love is also a fruit of the Spirit. The Bible tells us that God is love and that we should love one another as well. And the last time that you were here, you sang a song about the word joy. Do you know a song about love? Um... Yeah. Would you like to sing it for us? Um, uh, okay. <laughs> All right. That would be nice. Can you sing it for us now? Okay. Don't be shy. All right. Love, 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 love. The gospel in the radiant love. Love your neighbor as your brother. nice I like that good job and sometimes it's not real easy to love some people but Jesus loves all of us yeah and he loves everyone else and he wants us to try and love everybody as well and there's cookie came to say hi hi cookie well we hope everyone has a, a good week and remember the word love and maybe you can make a, a picture too <laughs> with love and we'll see you all again soon. Bye-bye. Greetings and welcome, people of God, to our conversation today on the subject of faith. Trying to contrast the possibility of deep spiritual experiences against faith as a social construct. This, I think, is an important subject in the light of what we have witnessed down south. We have watched the spiral of American evangelicalism and we are wondering what on earth is going on. We may find out some answers today. Very thankful for all the ministry partners that share in this wonderful privilege to bring God's word and the worship of God week after week. What a joy, what an honor. Thank you, everyone. So is faith a spiritual experience or just a social construction? Last week, we spend some time trying to understand how we can cultivate and sustain our walk with God. It seems to me that Christians all over the province and perhaps countrywide, continent-wide, are struggling with this subject of establishing and sustaining our spiritual walk with God. The subject has been on my mind a lot of late, which is why we have the twin subject today 
of contrasting faith as a spiritual experience to faith as a product of cultural socialization. It's a critical question in my mind, and I think COVID and Kamloops, COVID and Kamloops have brought new questions that present new points of departure from the established understandings of things, including faith. Big questions. And my wife was asking me why I like to take on some of these big subjects so often. I really don't, to a large measure, but they are subjects that must be dealt with. And, and so here we go. Is faith the product of a cultural orientation or is faith in Christ the product of a deep-seated spiritual experience? If I say the answer is yes, would that be confusing? It might be, but the answer is yes. Both are possibilities. Let's begin. We're trying to understand something about the making of our social consciousness. Sociologists agree that the family and society in which we are born give us a social context. They form the beginnings of our learning experiences. As we go into our teenage years, community and popular culture start to carry a larger share of the influence. University, if we go there, adds to that expanding mind. And then we come to the stresses of rent and bills and schedules of life, which impact us in ways that also challenge the way that we have understood life. We also find out that it's possible to go along with popular conceptions and popular culture, but we can also reject the popular culture. For example, church was once a very popular culture. Now, brunch is much more popular on Sunday morning than church. But there is no question that socialization has a big part to play in who we become. Think about it. People who grow up in an Islamic nation come out largely as Muslims. And people who grow up in a Hindu culture come out largely as Hindus, as do people who grow up largely in a Christian environment. They tend to come out Christian. It's a no-brainer. There are exceptions both ways. There are exceptions to all of them. But largely, that is the case. And I have found out that both in the valley and here in Metro, many churchgoers are children of other churchgoers, past and present. I have, I have even noticed something else in Christendom that many ministers of our faith are also children of other ministers as well, past and present. So there was Billy Graham and we now have Franklin Graham. There is Charles Stanley and there is also Andy Stanley and the list could go on. I don't give the examples necessarily to commend them. I could. But I just lay them out for us to observe. And this is not observable only in Christian terms. There are other examples I can give. Here is one about military families. You have heard the phrase, we are a military family. So the person will proudly say, I am a soldier. My father was a soldier. And his father was a soldier. That's three generations of military people. And we have all served 
in deployments overseas. It is said with pride. It is said with emphasis. It's worn as a badge of honor. So there is such a thing as inheriting our socialization. So yes, even faith can be inherited. But true faith requires much more than being inherited. True faith has to be acquired. It has to become personal. I can be born a Canadian citizen and I can be born a Zambian citizen. And that works. In fact, it is a very strong recommendation. But I can't be born a Christian. I have to become a Christian. That is why my answer to the question of faith as a social construct or a spiritual experience is a critical dialogue. In 1975, when I was only 17 years old, I knelt down to pray and seek God. That was a culmination of a year-long struggle to decide whether or not to be obedient to the vision from heaven, whether or not to be obedient to the call of God on my life. I could feel the call of God. I could hear the call of God. There was an unmistakable tug from God pulling me in his direction. But I was also resistant. And for the longest time, I did not want to submit my life to God. But on August 15, 1975, God broke the resistance. And I prayed and felt like I had hit the power line. The impact was instant. The sense of peace with God that is promised in the word, I found. The sense of sins forgiven was real. It was accompanied with a lightness in my spirit that produced so much joy. I broke out into singing and laughter and went on carrying on for quite a while. I knew that night God had found me. There was no mistake. I had found the Lord. So much so that when I woke up in the morning, the first thing I wanted to do was go home, a two-hour walk, to tell my mother I had given my life to the Lord. My mother looked at me and laughed and said, Son, Christianity is not talk. It is life. You have to live it, she said. And she was right. I just wanted to say, Mother, that I have made a start today. I have made a beginning. The result of which included a real delight in the Word of God and a new ability to sidestep the unspiritual social scene that was otherwise trapping every other young person, myself included. But after that change, I joined the disciplined children of God who were working super hard to live by the book. In fact, it was so compelling for me that that is where I trace the beginnings of the calling to the Christian ministry. The only thing I wanted to do those days was tell everybody else about the joy of the Lord, that Jesus had come into my life, and that you need Jesus, my friend, my brother. You need Jesus. What happened to me that day lives with me to this day. But let me share with you one way in which it showed up. It something I have called an insane commitment to God. And you will really see from this example that I was really turned on by God. I was really on fire for God as a 17 year old, 17, 18 year old college kid. I became chairperson of the Christian Fellowship at Evelyn Hunt College of Applied Arts and Commerce. That's where I studied for the diploma in journalism. That gave me three meetings, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday 
I was chairing meetings on campus. Thursday was our midweek fellowship time at the great Lusaka Baptist Church, and so I would head there every Thursday without fail. Friday was hangout time with the working adults, the graduates of institutions like our college, who used to gather for Bible study and some light moments of life. We hang out there like that little child who wants to tug along to the big brother or big sister and sticks on them like a bad smell. We enjoy doing that. And Saturday was young people's fellowship. Sunday, of course, was church. And we had it morning and evening. Did I miss any one of those? No. So you knew where to find me at those specific times each of those days. How could a 17, 18 year old give that kind of commitment living on a college campus? Well, it was possible because God did something special. Let me contrast that with a social faith. When God is a social construct, Participation is based on affiliation. So if your parents go, or your friends, or your grandparents, then you are likely going to go. And children raised in faith-based families tend to quit when they hit college. The faith is not strong enough to carry them through the rigors of college life. They join the so-called progressive mindset where the authority of the word does not apply. But watch this. When they go home to visit, they go back to church with their parents. Faith as a social construct is dependent on the social group. And what the social group is doing, everybody else seems to be doing. I even remember the example of a man who came to church one day. He was not a churchgoer. But he came to church and in my excitement, I was celebrating his presence when he said, my mother is sick and she couldn't come today. So I told her I would go for her. Faith as a social construct. It takes us to church for reasons other than God. And then of course, we have seen the politicization of faith in the United States. In fact, we could say the weaponization of faith in the United States. The word evangelical used to mean commitment to a particular historical position on the word of God, where the word of God had the final say. I had to come to Canada to find out that in America, it also or either or only means being a member of the Republican Party. When faith is a social construct, it can be overtaken by the culture. That's what we are seeing there. There is something else we will see when faith is a social construct. Giving of offerings to the house of God is dependent on exciting projects or loyalty to the institution or some of its leaders. As a result, it is sporadic and it is not an act of worship to the eternal God. And it can even be used as a weapon of protest for a variety of reasons. And when the big crises of life arise, faith as a social construct will not be adequate. And the biggest danger is probably that faith as a social contrast construct tends to marry the spirit of the age and as the late great Alan P.F. Sell wrote the church which marries the spirit of the age will be a widow in the next age and such faith tends to lend itself to be misused for the wrong purposes by the culture which is how the church was used to justify slavery and oppression I wish I could say that that was 
or is unthinkable. But enough injustices persist today under our watch. And these will shock future generations when they look back on our time in the faith. So yes, we should be outraged with slavery and oppression and marginalization. But we should think about the privileges we have in this culture while others live either without or with much fewer privileges. We're going to pause now for other elements in the worship service and we will resume with consideration of faith as a cleanser of culture en route to our quest for deep spiritual experiences. Hi everyone, our scripture today is Acts 26 verses 1 to 11 and it's from the Message Translation. I couldn't just walk away, is the title. Agrippa spoke directly to Paul. Go ahead, tell us about yourself. Paul took the stand and told his story. I can't think of anyone, King Agrippa, before whom I'd rather be answering all these Jewish accusations than you, knowing how well you are acquainted with Jewish ways and all of our family quarrels. From the time of my youth, my life has been lived among my own people in Jerusalem. Practically every Jew in town who watched me grow up, and if they were willing to stick their necks out, they'd tell you in person, knows that I lived as a strict Pharisee, the most demanding branch of our religion. It's because I believed it and took it seriously, committed myself heart and soul to what God promised my ancestors. The identical hope, mind you, that the twelve tribes have lived for night and day all these centuries. It's because I have held on to this tested and tried hope that I'm being called on the carpet by the Jews. They should be the ones standing trial here, not me. For the life of me, I can't see why it's a criminal offense to believe that God raises the dead. I admit that I didn't always hold to this position. For a time, I thought it was my duty to oppose this Jesus of Nazareth with all my might. Backed with the full authority of the high priest, I threw these believers, I had no idea they were God's people, into the Jerusalem jail right and left, and whenever it came to a vote, I voted for their execution. I stormed through their meeting places, bullying them into cursing Jesus, a one-man terror obsessed with obliterating these people. And then I started on the towns outside Jerusalem. Good morning, Timberley Baptist Church. Happy Sunday. I'm just going to lead us in a quick prayer. Dear Lord, we come to you today to t spend time in your presence and to praise you, O God. Today, I lift up the congregation of Timberley Baptist Church to you and pray for the spiritual growth of the church. Dear Lord, I just ask that you stir up our hunger and desire for you. We love you and we ask for a fire to burn in our hearts for you. As we walk daily with you, please give us the wisdom and discernment for the choices we make, for the things we take in and learn every day. I ask that especially in this time of social media and information overload, I pray that you give us the wisdom to make choices that reflect you in this world. I ask you, Lord, to give us wisdom in situations and circumstances that you have placed before us and for future challenges to come. Please give us the gift of wise words so that we can support each other and help those around us. I pray for the spiritual growth of the church as well as each person in our church family, that you give us the courage and strength we need to grow in our relationship with you. I ask that you help us face the things that we are fearful of so that we may grow strong in you, Lord. I pray also for our hearts in Christ to be softened. 
Please give us soft hearts that are quick to repent, quick to forgive, and quick to seek you, Lord. I pray that you give us hearts that are slow to anger. During this time of social isolation and virtual connections, I pray for our church members that we may find in each other support that will build us up in you and will help us be spiritually strong. As iron sharpens iron, so we rely on the strength of fellowship. I pray that during these times we are strengthened in each other. Lord, there is none like you in heaven above or earth beneath, and we praise your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I'll be reading from Acts 26, verses 12 to 23. One day, on my way to Damascus, armed as always with papers from the high priest authorizing my action, right in the middle of the day, a blaze of light, light outshining the sun, poured out of the sky on me and my companions. O king, it was so bright, we fell flat on our faces. Then I heard a voice in Hebrew, Saul, Saul, why are you out to get me? Why do you insist on going against the grain? I said, Who are you, Master? The voice answered, I am Jesus, the one you're hunting down like an animal. But now, up on your feet, I have a job for you. I've handpicked you to be a servant and witness to what's happened today and to what I am going to show you. I'm sending you off to open the eyes of the outsiders so they can see the difference between dark and light and choose light, see the difference between Satan and God and choose God. I'm sending you off to present my offer of sins forgiven and a place in the family inviting them into the company of those who begin real living by believing in me. What could I do, King Agrippa? I couldn't just walk away from a vision like that. I became an obedient believer on the spot. I started preaching this life, change, this radical turn to God and everything it meant in everyday life, right there in Damascus went on to Jerusalem and the surrounding countryside, and from there to the whole world. It's because of this whole world dimension that the Jews grabbed me in the temple that day and tried to kill me. They want to keep God for themselves. But God has stood by me just as he promised, and I'm standing here saying what I've been saying to anyone whether king or child, who will listen. And everything I'm saying is completely in line with what the prophets and Moses said would happen. One, the Messiah must die. Two, raised from the dead. He would be the first rays of God's daylight shining on people far and near. People, both godless and God-fearing. Thank you, thank you, everyone. I wanted to say at the beginning of the service that because I'm talking about life this week, as I did last week, I wanted to wear an outfit that is life-giving. And because green stands for greenery, I am wearing this green Zambian shirt today. As we broke off our message, I was just introducing the concept of faith as a cultural cleanser. When Jesus said that we are to be salt and light, he meant for us to have the same effect on society that salt has on things where it is applied. There are three significant things that salt does. Number one, it disinfects. And because it disinfects, it can preserve. And, and I think best of all, salt gives flavor. 
There it is. It can disinfect, it can preserve, and it can give flavor. Can I suggest that there is a wonderful call on each one of us from God to be salt and light, to shine the light in a dark pathway so that people in the world can see where to go and follow the Lord. And we can become the disinfectants of life, the preservers of life, and indeed the producers of flavor. What a church that will be. Everyone will want to be in that kind of church. And we have the opportunity to be that kind of church. We don't want to be the kind of example that so many churches in the U.S. have become. Where they become polluters of culture rather than cleansers of culture. I think the experience we are about to see of Paul will give us a tremendous example. But before we get to Paul, let me quickly refer to what we studied last week. We anchored the message on cultivating and sustaining faith in John chapter 8, where Jesus spoke and people believed. He spoke and people believed. And as many people continue to believe, he said to them, continue in the word. What I want to say is this. In the example of Paul, his encounter with God was spectacular. It was supernatural looking. Now, if you put your faith in God, it is supernatural. And here, when Jesus speaks and people believe, that is supernatural. My point is this. When you believe quietly or loudly, that faith you develop, the spiritual experience of that and others to follow can be as big, as powerful and as flashy as the one we're about to see in the life of the Apostle Paul. The encounters are never the same. Remember that Moses encountered God through the burning bush image. That is what allowed him to get into earshot of God to hear the call of God. The disciples on the road to Emmaus felt the burn of the word when Jesus was speaking to them on the road. They asked each other, didn't our hearts burn within us when he spoke to us on the road to Emmaus? The beauty of the word of God. I hope somebody's heart is burning as you hear the word of God being proclaimed right now. And yes, then there was that great roadside experience of the Apostle Paul that Tom read about for us. Paul's roadside appearance, uh, rather Christ's roadside appearance to Paul came in lightning fashion. You could say that Paul saw at the time got special CAA roadside assistance. My car has broken down enough the last little while that uh, I have roadside assistance on my mind. And Saul got special roadside assistance from the eternal God. The eternal God appeared to him. It will not always be dramatic. It can be as quiet as a silent prayer, but encounter God you must in whatever form, if you want to have a true spiritual experience that's more than just a social contrast, contra construct. So in Acts 26 verse 19, Paul shares his testimony of how he was on his way to Damascus to go and get permission to be torturing and killing the people of God when God appeared to him and asked him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? In the message translation of the word, here is verses 19 and 20 of Paul's words. What could I do, King Agrippa? I couldn't just walk away from a vision like that. I became obedient 
as a believer on the spot. I became an obedient believer on the spot. I couldn't just walk away from a vision like that. So I started preaching this life change, this radical turn to God and everything in it right there in Damascus. And I went on to Jerusalem, the surrounding countryside, and from there to the whole world. Paul had a great encounter. But isn't it wonderful to hear him say, I couldn't turn away from that vision. Have you had a deep spiritual encounter that you couldn't turn away? That kind of vision is a power that will impact your life the same way that it impacted Paul's life. But can human beings outside of the Bible save with this kind of insanity such as we see in Paul? That is why I told you about that young 18-year-old earlier. But observe that even though Paul had this spectacular experience, the key was obedience. I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. I could not turn away from a vision like that. And that I think explains a lot of things because obedience is a big issue in the modern day believer today. How much we obey God will often determine how much fire we carry for God. So let me summarize and conclude this message with four important things that we see in Paul's encounter. And you say, did you say four? Oh, that will keep us for another half hour. No, I think I can do it in less than four minutes. Let's try. Number one, Paul had an encounter with God. It was on the road to Damascus. For you and me, it may be our own time of quiet or loud prayer, as was my case in 1975. The key is to meet with God. The key is to hit the power line. That encounter produced a vision for Paul of witnessing and becoming a servant of God. I can say it did the same for me. That was 1975. Paul's response was one of obedience to the vision. He was happy to carry the message that God gave him to start carrying. I am happy to carry that message too. That is part, what I'm do part of what I am doing right now and do often in different ways. And my prayer is that you have just as much joy in sharing the good news that Jesus says, that you are pleased to wear it as a badge of honor as we saw last week that you are not afraid to brag about God. And the result for Paul was a lifetime of dedicated service, a lifetime of dedicated service. Next week, I turn 63. I gave my life to Christ when I was 17. It's been a joy, a privilege to serve God all these years. My point is this, people of God. We may have began with faith as a social construct. It needs to lead to an encounter with God that is sustainable. And it does not need to become one solitary encounter that we refer to for once upon a time. That becomes the door and opening to many more spiritual encounters. Can we do it, people of God? Yes, we can. If you are counting, that's less than four minutes. Let's worship the Lord together. Precious Lord, thank you for the example of Paul, a man who was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. I can think of many times when I have been disobedient to your vision, eternal God. And I pray forgiveness. As we worship together today, my prayer is that for all of God's people listening, tuning in, wherever they are, 
There will be an excitement on a turning towards you, eternal God. That there will be a joyful acceptance of the call to be salt and light. So that this world, this world that is so darkened at this time, will have the light of life. Because Jesus said he is the light of the world and those who follow will not walk in darkness. So times may be dark, but the light will shine. And we pray that Jesus will continue to shine in all of our darkest moments. So thank you for the gift of your word and the opportunity to open it up for one another. Bless it to each one of us, we pray, and let it rest and abide in our hearts, that we may be obedient to it and grow in our love for you and grow in our capacity to serve you. Grant it, we pray, through Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining in, people of God. And we pray that you have a blessed weekend and looking forward to next Sunday with the women of our church leading us in worship on Father's Day. But bring it on, ladies. Bye-bye now. Amen. from